Welcome to the Night Mode edition of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. We're on the Come and Talk to Me Network. This is my dynamic co-host, my guy, Blue. Games don't stop, Blue, which means we are still working. Great games tonight. Some, 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 some exciting things to talk about. Oh, yeah. We got a lot to talk about, man. It's just a lot. I saw a lot tonight, man. We might have seen a passing over of a torch, honestly. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into it too early, but I saw a lot tonight, man. I'm not gonna argue how, with how you. How did you feel about the games? It was uh, statements made, statements made, which is what playoff basketball is all about: embracing the bright lights and making your statements. Before we get to anything, we got to shout out our sponsors who keep the lights on. Underdog Fantasy. Scan the QR code in the corner and go to the site. Play the Pick'em game. That's our favorite, man. So. As I, as I touched on a little bit before, we watched Ant-Man and the Timberwolves completely dismantle the Phoenix Suns. First off, in my opinion, Ant-Man is the best shooting guard in the world at this moment. Second off, what did you see tonight? Just first thoughts of that game. <laughs> well, he's certainly making his case. He's making his case for it. He's not only going against Devin Booker. He's going against Bradley Beal. He's going against Kevin Durant. He's going against, quite honestly, before the season started, one of the favorites to win the championship. And he has made an emphatic statement, and not just as a scorer, but as an elite player and playmaker. He has put his team on his back, setting the tone. I understand for a young guy to do it at home. He had the audacity to do it in Phoenix with their back against the wall to send a message you may have been able to turn it on at some point in your career and disregard a challenge, but not this challenge. He is locked and loaded and uh, awfully impressive. I, I, love his, I love everything about his game, playing with the edge, playing with extreme confidence, trusting his teammates, and picking, his choos- picking and choosing his spots when to be aggressive as a scorer. Absolute thing of beauty. And I came in believing that Devin Booker was the, the best shooting guard in the world and Edwards. Has, has changed my mind, and uh, he's, he's, he's grabbed the light from not just Edwards, but also Bill and Durant. Yeah, just their swag, their demeanor is, is not, it's not at the right level, man. Ed man walking around with that Jordan-type demeanor that I'm the best dude on the court, and I'm not going to say that KD or Devin Booker don't believe that they are the best dudes on the court, but their level of play and intensity lately, it's lacking, man. It's lagging. It's, it, the, I believe the difference is Ann Edwards is playing like it's personal. He's playing like a kid that dreamt of this moment and now the, the moment has presented itself and he is prepared for that moment, grabbing it and looking forward to never handing it back. He is, his mentality is, is, is compared to the legends that we've seen in the past. And he's a no-nonsense guy. He's, he, he's arrogant, he's cocky, but he's also humble, which is a strange combination. But he knows what to say and when they ask him in this, you know, interview after the game, what do you expect? You're up 3-0. He said, I've never been in this situation. Ain't no reason for me to get cocky or arrogant and think about sweeping. No, no, I, ne- I never won a playoff series. So he believes he's that dude, but at the same time, he gives credit and respect and he keeps his humility. That edge, that combination is a perfect, perfect combination. Yeah, man. Now this is the this is the first time that the Timberwolves will be winning, and I don't want to I don't want to wrap up. Matter of fact, no, I do want to wrap up the Suns because we wrapped up the Lakers. The Suns is done too, so this will be the first time that the <laughs> <laughs> no, this will be the first time since two thousand and four that the Timberwolves have won a playoff series. How big of a deal is this for this Timberwolves team, and how far do you see them going? They are a dangerous team. Like I said about any team in, this, in the, these playoffs, East or West, they have the ability to advance. They have the ability to get to the championship, the conference finals. They have the ability to win it all. When you talk about they were chasing the number one seed. They were right there. Everybody played an 82-game season. They chased the number one seed and was right there towards the end. So they're more than capable. You talk about their depth, their versatility, their competitive spirit, the way they get after it. It is, it is awfully impressive. And I, I, another thing I love, Ant Edwards did the post-game interview. He shouted out Nas Reed and Nikhil Alexander-Walker. He, he wasn't thinking about himself. 
That's a guy that understood I got numbers, but it wasn't about what I did. It's about what the supporting cast did. Across the board, it was a total team effort and awfully impressive. And if they play that way, they have a chance. Yeah, I see a lot of, uh, <clears throat> even just speaking to that point that you just made of the post-game speech, it's a lot of similarities between the culture of OKC and uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves because that's something that I could see SGA doing after a game also. And and can you just speak to some of the habits, some of the things that you've seen that make those two teams be two of the top teams in the, in the NBA? That's a great point you just made because that approach, that mentality, you can't fake it. You can't fake it. It shows itself when you're selfish on the offensive end or unselfish. Unselfish. It's, it shows itself if you're locked and loaded, rotating quick to help the helper and responding defensively. Your principles are on point. Guys not pouting. Guys not upset. Guys, guys not you know holding their head down. A tied together team. One one interview. And Ed, Edwards uh, talks about his supporting cast. Another interview. Shea Gilgis Alexander has his whole team behind him when he's doing an interview. So you definitely see the similarities, and you see that it's it's not a coincidence why both of these teams are clicking on all cylinders and dangerous, not just today, but tomorrow and moving forward. Yeah, man, I I, I look at, um, yeah, it's just amazing. I'm looking at these two teams and just how important a culture, a good culture is, because we didn't touch on it yesterday, but I watched D'Lo sit at the end of the bench and eat snacks and be separate separated from his Lakers team. It's It's just amazing how, the culture can can equate to wins oftentimes. You're right. And and you, you talk about that situation with D'Lo. I don't know what it happened. All I know is there's a guy sitting by himself as the huddle's taking place. I blame that guy. I blame the leadership. I blame the dudes in uniform. I blame the coaches. I'm stopping the meeting. Okay, you either with us or go in the back. We're not going to have that because we're going to win as a team. We're going to lose as a team. I thought it was selfish. And I thought it was lack of leadership across the board. Now, sometimes you're a coach, you're not aware of what just took place. You get back after the game and you see it. But whoever saw it should be held accountable. That's unacceptable, and that's not the way you lead. What you want as a, as a, as a team, I always said it when I went in, went in my job interview. I, I want great leaders, and I want great followers. I don't want the guys in between because the great followers know to, to follow the great leaders. The ones in, in between will be a cancer for your entire lineup and in your entire team, and, and waiting for the opportunity to go to the Bahamas or go to where? Cancun! <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. I know it's a, it's a Timberwolves fan that's watching and saying, how did these dudes get back on the Lakers somehow? So I got to go back and give credit to somebody that I thought stood out tonight and somebody that I think is not getting enough credit, and that's Rudy Gobert. Playing defensively amazing, competing, and extremely efficient around the basket. What do you see from the Frenchman? He took it personal. You can make the case they were eliminated because of his inability to be on the floor when it mattered most because he got exposed. As great as he is defensively, his inability to defend the 1-5 screen and roll or the 2-5 high screen and roll. Now all of a sudden, Rudy Gobert has the ability to switch that. And he doesn't have to shut a guy down. Just give me good defense and make them work. Contest a shot. Make them work. Make them get rid of the basketball. Get back into the action. He's done an outstanding job of that. And people, I'm about to say something that you're going to say, if you don't know basketball and you don't know how it works, you're going to say it's absurd. Rudy Gobert is a future Hall of Famer. He will be in the Hall of Fame without a question. You're talking about a guy that's a fourth, will be a four-time defense player of the year. His body of work, his resume, if he stops playing today, he's getting in the Hall. So don't at me. Pay attention to the history. Look at his resume and you'll be impressed. Awfully impressed with the way he's playing, the way he's responded to failure in the past, and now has made the proper adjustments. That's how you do it as a pro. So salute Rudy Gobert. Yeah, salute Rudy, man. I want to know what is going on? What's going on with these older guards and just older dudes in the NBA? Why does Mike Conley look like an action figure out there? This is the best I've seen Mike Conley look in years. As a veteran, that dude is ready. It's called doing your job, doing what's asked of you. They're not asking them to go out and get 30. They're not asking them to go out and, you know, do something special every night. They're just – when you're coaching, 
All I want you to do is not hurt me. I want you to put us in position to win and do the things that matter to winning. And Mike Conley is the consummate pro. He's an elite guy that you can rely on as a coach, as a winning culture. He's a, he's a voice. He has held guys accountable. He has gotten Rudy, Rudy Gobert engaged offensively. He knows when to give him the basketball. He knows when to get out of uh, Anthony Edwards' way. He knows when to call Anthony Town need to eat. It's just a veteran point guard that's an extension of the coach that holds guys accountable and, 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 and does things in a professional way that, that becomes contagious all throughout your locker room. Okay, so I want to know, sticking with this game, what, in your eyes, is the Suns' biggest problem? Competitive spirit. When they turn it on, they climb back into the game. Six guys in the Minnesota Timberwolves roster scored double digits tonight. Six guys in a playoff game. You gave up 126 points in your building in a must-win situation. I said it before. I'm playing the dogs. I'm playing the dudes that's going to compete at a high level. I don't care about names. I'm playing the guys that's going to compete and give me a chance because I already recognize that doing it the other way, we down 2-0, and now we're down 3-0. The bottom line is you got to find guys that's willing to do the little things and insert them this time of year. You look, that's what the Minnesota Timberwolves doing. Those guys are willing to do the little things. They're not afraid to play guys because they have competitive drive, competitive spirit, and it's not about scoring. It's about doing my job, and that's why they're up 3-0 and the Phoenix Suns are down 0-3. They got to find the right group of guys that's committed to doing the things to put them in position to get back into this series. All right, man, this is the tough question. I hope you're ready for this. Are they going to have to blow the Phoenix Suns up? If they lose this series, they're going to have to clean some things up. I'm not coming back with the same team. I'm not coming back in the same situation. It didn't work. We tried it. It didn't work. And I will have to make the proper adjustments moving forward if I was them. Yeah, man, this is tough. This is it's a wrap. I'm not going to front. You got you got to be be nice about it. It's a wrap. Blow it all up. Send KD somewhere. If you want to keep send keep KD people. somewhere. If K, if KD want to go somewhere, if, if KD I'm I'm not saying I I think KD is the best is the best on that team, so I'm not going to disrespect KD. I'm saying blow it up and get what you can. I don't think that this core wins a championship. No, I'm not blowing it up. I'm too Not talented blow up, to man. blow it up. I'm going to make the tweaks and the adjustments needed to put us in position to regroup and have a chance next year. I got to insert some guys that are willing to do the dirty work, that's willing to compliment my stars, and then we'll, we'll make another attempt. But I'm certainly not getting rid of my home run talent in Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. You left Smiles out. No, no, no. <laughs> Bradley, no, Bradley Beal... <laughs> I want to keep them, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave my options on the table. I'm going to see what I can get for him. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a future Hall of Famer, but it didn't work. So I, if I'm forced to bring him back, I'll bring him back with the compliment, complimentary pieces that I talked about. If not, he's on the table, and I'm going to use him as an asset to try to improve our talent. But I think everything outside of Durant and Booker to me is on the table we're trying to improve this basketball team. Everything. I agree. I'm with you on that one. It's, you, let me ask you, they got a shot to come back? Come back to Phoenix for game four, 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, in, in all honesty, you say no, but they do have a shot. They do have a shot, a small shot. And the way that the, you, you've given this young, energetic basketball team life, and confidence and a swag and they smell blood and they're led by a guy that when he smells blood, he's a different animal in Ann Edwards. So I would say they don't have a chance, but it's a small window that the, the mentality is take care of business in game four and give ourselves, give ourselves a chance moving forward. Hmm. All right, man. Second game of the night. Before we, we get Matt. into the second game, I want to make a point last night's game. I didn't touch on it, and I had a tough night sleeping because I didn't touch on it. Joel Embiid's foul to Mitchell Robinson. I truly believe, we didn't touch on it last night, but I truly believe that Joel Embiid, 50 points in all, the Mama There Goes That Man Award winner last night, should have been 
a flagrant two and ejected from the ball game for the foul on Mitchell Robinson. I believe a grabbing of his, of his legs as he was going up to dunk it was a dirty play. And listening to the explanation from the referees in Secaucus, he talked about what played into a, 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 what played a factor in the decision making to make it a flagrant one was that Mitchell Robinson landed softly and there was no concern to his injury. Landing has nothing to do, to, do with it. So I want to encourage guys to fake land and take a dive and sell the call. The bottom line is it was a dirty play. It was a flagrant two grabbing a guy in the midair, and he should have been ejected from the ball game. So I just wanted to let that be known, my personal feelings about that particular play. Yeah, I think – you think he should have been suspended? No, I mean, no, no, no. Ejected he, from the game? Yeah, as a flagrant two. Yeah, he should have been ejected oh, from the game. Man. That's that's oh, you say, man, let let somebody grab you out the air. No, by, that's by tough both of your legs. What what huh? He grabbed him out of the air by his legs. That's a yes. dangerous play. Yes, he did. That's a dangerous yes, he play. Did. Huh? That's a dangerous and dirty play, my guy. No, it's a dangerous play. It was dangerous. I just don't think. For you to be a ref in that situation and pull pull the trigger and say, I'm going to eject Joel Embiid when the dude didn't get hurt. Yeah, it could have gotten ugly, but I didn't think it needed a suspension. I'm not a ref in that situation. We have come together. We have analyzed the play. We have witnessed it and watched the replay over and over again. Nothing about that play, say, is a basketball play. And I don't put into the equation how he came down, how he landed. The bottom line is he grabbed his legs in midair and it could have gone ugly. I have no horse in the race. It doesn't matter to me who wins. It's a dirty play, and I feel personally he should have been ejected. Now we're going to stand up for your Knicks, Pops. No, no, no. I have – no, I got I, – I root for one team. <laughs> one team. My daughter works for the Portland Trailblazers. That's it. Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right My now, daughter heaven, do, by the way. <laughs> if you don't mind, can we get to the second game? Yes. Okay, all right, all right. So we saw the Mavericks go up 2-1 against the Clippers with a big win. Ky- Kyrie and Luka played good. But this was an opportunity for the Clippers team that I feel they let slip. What did you see tonight? I saw a Mavericks team that played tied together. That had, you know, what we talked about losing early in the series. Luka and Kyrie had no help. It was no supporting cast. Now all of a sudden, you get guys... Like Derek Jones with, with double digits, PJ Washington with double digits, Derek Lively double digits. You get uh, Josh Josh Green who does a great job defensively, scores the basketball. So you you, you get uh, D- Daniel Gafford does a great job scoring eight points. So they, they did it as a team collectively, and they helped Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic, uh, and, and allowed those guys to save some of the energy when they had to put their imprint on the basketball game. They certainly did. But I see a Clipper team right now that, simply put, is not tied together. They're not tied together. And you see the similarities in the teams that we think are loaded talent-wise and they fall short in, in wins and losses and, and, and how passionate they are about, you know, going after winning ball games and winning the series. And it's disappointing. And I think the Clippers fit that mold right now. They're more than capable of winning this series. They're more than capable of getting healthy and whole and bouncing back. But what I'm seeing right now is a team that, 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 that to a certain extent, ha- has tapped out. So I hear you going down the list of the Maverick stats and going, going and saying how many players contributed. But I'm looking at this Clippers stat line, and this is extremely pedestrian. You have Paul George, 7 points, 3 for 11. Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard with 9 points, 4 for 7. Russell Westbrook, 19 minutes, 1.0 for 7. What do you do as a coach to tap into these dudes who have tremendous talent but have been underachieving? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring us together and say, anybody hurting? Anybody hobbled? Anybody have any excuse that they're not playing clip of basketball, that we're not getting after it and playing with the passion and the focus that winning a playoff game demands? And then when they say yes or no, if you say yes, I excuse you from the next ball game. If you say no, then we have no excuse not to put forth the effort that need, that's needed to beat this Dallas Mavericks team. It is, it is, you can see it, it's pretty obvious, the consistent theme throughout these playoffs. 
This looks like a team that has tapped out. This looks like a team that's not tied together. And Luka Doncic has played against the Los Angeles Clippers, I believe, 10 or 11 times in the playoffs, 10 or 11 games in the playoffs. He is averaging 30 points per game, five-plus assists, and five-plus rebounds. He has been the best player when those two teams have gotten together. At some point, you got to realize we're not going to, for lack of a better term, we're not going to punk him. We're not going to hit him and scare him. He is legit and all-time great. We have to beat him with force. The dude has been a pro since he's been 13 years old. Kyrie Irving is from the East Coast. He's from Jersey. You're not going to scare him. They play with an edge. You have to beat him by executing. You have to beat him by doing it as a team. And we got to take the challenge. And quite honestly, you haven't taken the challenge and you find yourself in trouble because this is a dangerous team that now the role players have gotten life and gained confidence. Speaking of Kawhi Leonard, is it – is this a special situation or is it just always hard to integrate somebody who's been away from the team for a while? It depends on how healthy he is. If he's, if he's healthy and a hundred percent, then he's the best player. It's easy. We're going to, it's not, it's not like w- w- this is, uh, um, Mark Jackson and Pat Ewing. I'm on the perimeter. He's on the interior. So we're not running the same stuff. The things you ran for, James Harden, mm-hmm. the things you run for Paul George, the things you run for Norman Powell or Russell Westbrook, similar. you run the same stuff for Kawhi Leonard. So it's as simple as filling that position. We're going to run the same stuff. We don't call nothing different. So it should be an easy, smooth transition inserting him back into the lineup, even though he's been absent, but he's your home run hitter. But I don't like the way that they're going through the motions. I don't like the way that they're trying to feel their way into the game. No, this is playoff basketball. It's, it's win or go home. And their mentality, their approach, it, it just doesn't say sense of urgency to me, which is, which is disappointing and discouraging. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, I wouldn't say that they're laying down. Like I, like I saw some, some of the Lakers games, I, I saw them lay down. I don't think the Clippers have reached that point. But for the talent level that they have, I don't think that their their level of competition has raised to that standard. I blame myself. When I look at the Phoenix Suns, when I look at the Los Angeles Lakers, when I look at the Los Angeles Clippers and teams like that, the great Michelle Obama said, when somebody tells you who, who they are, believe them. I didn't believe it. So I gave these teams a chance. I thought they, they have a chance to win it all. They have shown disregard and disrespect to the entire season, going through the motions, being great one week or one day, the next day losing. They've been inconsistent with their energy, their effort, and their pursuit. <clears throat> and I should have trusted what my eyes said they were. And it's, it's unfortunate, but now they're paying the price. You can't turn it on and off in this league. Not regular season, not postseason. Now, there are rare situations and rare talent that can turn it on. But, but overall, historically, you got, you, got, you got to get after it so that when the lights come on, you've been approaching it with that same mentality night in and night out. All right, so with the Clippers being in this vulnerable situation, being wounded, going into game four, what is the Mavericks' mindset dealing with this team in a, in a, a dangerous situation? They should have had us when we were asleep. Now we, we are wide awake with our eyes open and clicking on all cylinders. Let's not go back. Let's not go back. Let's take care of business and send a message to this team that this series is absolutely over. I give credit to Jason Kidd and the way that he had his team prepared, the way they responded, and the way that they, they approached the game. Now, now it's, 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 it's easy to do it one night. Now you have to have that sustained effort and continue to do it. And I think the approach is let's take care of business and make sure that we go back to L.A. up 3-1. Speaking of Jason Kidd, if you're in his position, how do you make sure your team is ready? We talk about it. I'm, if I'm in Jason Kidd's position, I'm talking about the experience that I had as a player. I'm not telling you what, what somebody taught, told me. I'm telling you what I experienced. I've been in that seat. I've been, I've been up 2-1 in the playoff series. I've been down 1-2 in the playoff series. I can tell you how, how, how the, the approach should be and what our mentality should be going into to, to game four. And, and if, we have, if we fall short with our approach and our mentality and we're setting ourselves up, to give this team life and to lose a series. You don't want to have regrets 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, saying we had a team that could have 
went to the conference finals or went to the finals or won a championship, but we, we, we gave Kawhi Leonard and Paul George and James Harden and Russell Westbrook life. No, you don't want to have that mentality, that approach. Deliver that message. Tell them the experience that you had as a player and, 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 and scare them, for lack of a better, better word, scare them into being ready, locked and loaded in game four. And I heard during the telecast, Luka Doncic is an all-time great player already. I believe that. I believe he's a top 50 and even closer. He is an all-time great player. One thing he is not, he is not a better passer than Jason Kidd. Luka Doncic will end up with more assists in his career if he stays healthy than Jason Kidd. He is not a better passer than Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd was, was, was in that special room of passes. Uh, and I, got, I just got to let that be known because I heard it during the telecast and I took it personal. Luka's incredible. He's an incredible passer. Jason Kidd is in a, in, in a different room. You better stand up for your fellow all-time great point guard. <laughs> no, no, I'm just Luca, – Luca's an all-time great. So I'm not yeah, disrespecting yeah. him. I love him. But that's like saying, you know, Jason Kidd can shoot as well as Steph Curry. No, I would be like, no, you're out of line. Jason Kidd, no. Even though he's up on the charts, he's not the shooter. But, it, but as yeah. far as his gift as leadership and tenacity and defending, and especially his gift of passing, that's a different animal. All right, man. So, you know, I, I called this weeks ago. We watched the Pacers bring it to the Bucks. Tyrese Halliburton played well, has 16 assists. Miles Turner had 29 points to overturn a good night, a great night from Chris Middleton of 42 points and 10 rebounds and even Dame having 28. What did you see from the Pacers tonight that allowed them to separate from the Bucks? I saw them play like they wanted to take over the series. Like they took care of business in Milwaukee. They responded. They played with pace. They got great energy, great effort. 19 offensive rebounds over the course of the game. Uh, Miles Turner was special, 29-9. and nine. Uh, uh, Nemhart was outstanding, aggressively looking to score, but more importantly, defending. Dame Lillard making life tough. So it was, it was uh, Pascal Siakam playing well. Again, not as well as he did in Milwaukee, but doing enough. I saw a team that wanted to win and got after it with their approach and their defensive intensity and their pace. The thing about them, they pushed the basketball off makes and misses. You get 121 points in a playoff game, you got a chance, especially when you defend defensively. So the, when you get after defensively, concern with the Pacers is we're going to be able to score. Are we going to compete on the defensive end? When we do that, we can beat anybody. The only yeah, thing I even, didn't like about the Pacers was up three twice with an opportunity to foul. I don't understand the teams and the coaches in these situations that don't foul. So many things have to go right for you to lose if you foul. So one thing has to go wrong in order for them to tie the game, which they did, Chris Middleton knocking down two threes at crucial points by not fouling. I thought they had more than enough ample opportunity to foul, and they did not, and it almost cost them a big playoff game. I heard some, I heard some reports, I don't know if they're true, but that the plan was to actually foul for both of those plays. It very well could be, but that's still on me. Because I, I, we went over it in practice, and somebody didn't get it. I remember p telling a player, as, as a young player, we were up in Cleveland, and we were up three, and the plan was coming out of the timeout to foul as soon as Kyrie Irving goes into his bag. He goes into his bag, the defender on him doesn't foul, elevates, knocks down a three. We win the game in overtime. But that's on me, because either I didn't deliver the message correctly, I got to insert somebody else in the ball game. Now that person ultimately became an all-time great defender, but started off making mistakes and had to learn, which was crucial. But that, that's on that's on that's on me as a coach. I can't say I told you, I told you, I told you. No, I, I got to be better and explain it better, and we got to execute it better. Now, some people are saying that the only reason the Bucks are struggling is because there's no Giannis. Now, putting on your coaching hat, how do you, how do you make this uh, Bucks team effective without their best player? 
you have to insert some energy that matches the energy that the Pacers have responded with uh, in the lineup. I think you got to steal some minutes. You got to trust some guys. I saw Jackson played a little bit and outstanding defender made some plays that sparked them. Bobby Portis, another good game. Middleton played very well, obviously, big time on the offensive end. Dame Lillard played well. So, so there's, there's some good things to take from it, but, but I think you can steal some minutes with, with some of those bench guys that can give you energy and effort. You know, Patrick Beverly is, is, is an outstanding defender, but he's, for lack of a better term, somewhat limited on the offensive end. You may want to force them to have to defend and not take possessions off by keeping the pressure on them by inserting somebody in there that, that's, that's a knockdown shooter or a scorer. I just think you need some life off of that bench, trust some guys, and then uh, build some confidence, and then it's a whole different series. Okay. It's time to award our player of the night, or as we like to call it around here, the mama. There goes that man award. So I already got a feeling that I know who it's going to, but I'm going to give you the floor and you let us know. This was a tough decision. It wasn't as easy as people think because I look at what Indiana did at home with Tyrese Halliburton setting the tone with incredible numbers and a big time win. But I had to go in a different direction. Anthony Edwards wins tonight's award. 36, nine and five setting the tone defensively, leading his basketball team, playing with an edge against first ballot Hall of Famers, was absolutely special. Did not disappoint and is chasing, chasing the all-time greats and has an edge and a nastiness about him that I salute. With that being said, tonight's Mama There Goes That Man Award goes to Anthony Edwards. Let me give him the respect he deserves. Anthony Edwards, Mama. There goes that man. There we go. Mama, there goes that man for Ant-Man. I'm telling you, he, 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 he is chasing the grace, but he's caught a lot of them already. We watching it right now. Just saying. He has to, I'm not going to be disrespectful. He's got to continue it. You can't do it. The greats don't do it. He hasn't won a series. So I'm not going to be disrespectful. The greats have sustained greatness, not just one night or one series. Okay. All right. I'm gonna simmer down. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you <laughs> calm me down. I'm gonna let you calm me down. I know okay. you're waiting, though. You're waiting. Oh no, I'm waiting. Don't let it. Don't let the series. When we come back two days from now, and the series is over. Just know, I'm jumping out the window. You know, just think about <laughs> when I talk about Anthony Day, Anthony Edwards' humility. He said he's on Team USA. He said I'm, I, I, I don't care if I start or not. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be part of it and want to help in any way I can. You think about. The success he's had, he should be like, yo, I'm starting. I'm the best in the world. But he give, he's, he's showing grace and humility and, and saying the right things, even though he plays with an edge. I just love the combination of arrogance, cockiness, and humility. You rarely see them in, in, in the type of form that he's displaying. Yeah, he's a great player, man. Great player. All right, now that we broke the, play, broke the games down, I need to hear from Coach Jackson for a second. Coach Mark, can you help us? Yes, I can. All right, all right, all right. So let's get my Lakers out the way. Can you confirm are the Nuggets going to send the Lakers to Cancun? I believe that they will. Um, the Lakers are good enough, and they've displayed the ability to control the game, dictate the pace, and take care of the basketball but they haven't been able to do it for 48 minutes. So why am I to believe that they have the ability to do it for 48 minutes against this Denver Nuggets team that almost seems to be toying with them to turn on the switch when they want to and take over the game? So I'm going with the Denver Nuggets to sweep the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, which would be uh, an embarrassing end to the season for the Lakers. Okay. Spinning off that, you're in Darvin Ham's seat. What – do you say to this team while keeping it real, but also encouraging them and getting ready for this next game? I'm keeping it simple. If you are not with this team tied together, then stay in the locker room. 
Matter of fact, don't stay in the locker room. Go home now. I'll make sure. I'll go to Jeannie Bus and Rob Palenka and make sure that we don't dock your pay. You will get every dollar that that's, you're supposed to get. Don't worry about it. You get your game check. But I don't need this cancer in this locker room or on my bench. I need five, 10, 15 guys that's tied together that have one mission, not to win four games. I don't need you to win four. I don't need you to win four games. I just need you to win one. And then we'll take, 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 take the next game into account. But let's get one and give ourselves a chance to change this series. Give me a tied together group that's committed to go get one. If you're not, bow out now. Bring it in. I like that. I like that. I like that. I feel I'm bringing it in. I'm bringing it in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got Boston at Miami tied 1-1. There's pressure on Joe Missoula to get a win in Miami. What is he telling his team going into this next game? We ran away with the Eastern Conference. We are clearly the best team in the East. We ran away with the number one seed. All we have to do is win a game. I don't care where we play. We've proven to be the best team. We didn't win all those games in Boston at our home. We, we, we toured the world. We toured the NBA. And we dominated. So it's no surprise what we have to do tonight. Take care of business against this Miami Heat team. Give them the credit that they deserve. They came into our house. They put their foot on our table. And they act a fool. Let's return the favor. All right, all right. I like that. I like that. Okay. Let's take a moment and thank our sponsors, Underdog Fantasy. Scan the QR code, and it'll take you right to the site. Play the pickup game. That's our favorite, man. That's a wrap for this episode of the Mark Jackson Show. Remember, old preacher once said, greatness never goes on sale. He followed it up with saying, it costs what it costs. I am watching playoff teams go through the motions fake hustle, and not show up in a pursuit to win and win a championship. And I'm also watching you cut corners in a pursuit to accomplish all your dreams. It doesn't go on sale. There's no way to shortchange it. There's only one price for greatness. The question is, are you willing to pay the price? It's non-negotiable. Blessings. Blessings.